thanks for being here. Um, I looked at the schedule and I almost didn't attend this one. <laughs> but anyway, so um, my name is Tom Caswell. I'm the Open Education Policy Associate at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Is my time up? <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm here to talk to you about um, some of our experiences with uh, creating the Open Course Library. And, um, and I'm here with Connie Brogan, who's the Director of E-Learning and Open Education. She'll be sharing a little bit more um, in the next half hour. Um, but uh, I'm just going to run through a little bit on, let's see, there we go. Um, so one of the things that, that we've had to do in our system is make the case for open education. And so um, as we set up the Open Course Library, um, and started to recruit faculty to be part of the Open Course Library, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. Um, we uh, we we had to make our our case, and so we we argue in, in terms of efficiency, um, the fact that you can build on um, great existing content that's already out there. Uh, affordability certainly is a big issue in in, in our state, and uh, uh, we have student groups who are. Uh, who have been very concerned about uh, textbook affordability, and uh, and that's and that that's an important concern for us as well at the state board. Um, there's a quality issue, and I think that you can make the case for quality. I would argue that developing in the open, um, and we we've seen this as our faculty have prepared to launch the Open Course Library. Um, the first 42 courses are going to be made available to the public on Monday. So October 31st, our first 42 courses, all the materials for those courses and, and, um, will, be, will go out into the public. And I can just tell you that when faculty know that it's going to be on the web, out in the open, yeah, they go back and double check. And they, they, <laughs> they, do a, they run that spell checker and they do that proofreading one more time. So, um, and then there's just a self-interest argument to be made that um, uh, you know, we've seen time and again that um, working out in the open, if, if you can show up in the top, you know, the top results of a Google search, for example, or, um, uh, or, or something like it, it, it increases your exposure as a faculty member and there are all kinds of reasons why, you know, that, that leads to good things. Working in the open can lead to collaboration, um, it can lead to um, new opportunities for the faculty. So, so those are some reasons. Um, now, actually, I'm going to pause here for just a sec and, and just explain a little bit more um, about the Open Course Library. And I think I think I put I put my slides in a, in a goofy order, but basically, the Open Course Library is an effort to take the the highest enrolling and most um, most critical 81 courses and and create open openly licensed content for every course. So what we did in, in Washington, we, and, and it, it was uh, jointly funded by the Washington State Legislature and the, the Gates Foundation. So, so we very much have a state that's very bought in to the idea of open education, and I love that. Um, because we have state legislators and uh, you know, we have policymakers who, who really see this as, as um, an efficiency that we need to grab onto. So what we want to do is deliver on that, and uh, and that's the Open Course Library is really um, instead of taking sort of tinkering around the edges, um, the Open Course Library just really grabs the bull by the horns and says we're going to take our top courses, we're going to make open openly licensed materials available on all those 81 courses, and then um, and then we're going to push we're going to have a an adoption effort around that and uh, and really you know push push this. Um, as an efficiency and as a, um, an opportunity for faculty who, <clears throat> excuse me, in our system, <clears throat> in our system we have 75% adjunct faculty. So we have an issue where uh, faculty are in a situation they have to uh, many times um, develop course materials very quickly because they're coming into a new course and, uh, um, and, and they need to ramp up and get ready to teach very quickly, sometimes just within a, a, you know, a few weeks or even a few days. So these materials provide, um, you know, basically 
this is an opportunity for them to have a starting point to not have to start from zero. Um, and, and so they can grab these materials, modify them, and, uh, and um, customize them in the way that works for them. But the other important thing that I should mention about the open course library is that um, we didn't slam the door on publishers. We actually, um, what we said was, you know, uh, we, we want all comers. We want, uh, we want to be able to work with high quality educational content. The problem is $200 textbooks just don't work for us. Um, and so we capped the, the cost of the textbooks per, per open course library course at $30. So, um, and you would think that, gosh, well, you might as well have slammed the door if it's just $30. But actually, we had um, publishers come and, and really work with us. And so, um, Cengage as a prime example, um, but there were others as well who, who uh, were willing to come and, and figure out what they could do um, to help our faculty at the $30 price point. So, um, so anyway, we, um, we had... The, those were the parameters around the open course library, and it was developed over over a, the period a period of, of roughly a year. So, um, so what I want to talk a little bit about is how this is different, um, or, or how our approach is a little bit different than, say, uh, an open courseware uh, site, because um, I used to work with the Open Courseware Consortium, and we had a lot of um, you know, helped set up a lot of great open courseware sites, but this is really a little bit different, and, and I just want to sort of point out the differences. Um, and that's where this comes in. So your typical open courseware workflow, you've got a faculty member who creates a course that they're teaching, and then you have um, sort of a separate track where, um, where there's some support staff of some kind that then comes in and um, and offers, uh, you know, takes the faculty's syllabus notes, uh, materials, and um, and sort of organizes them and puts them into an open course. Uh, now, this isn't every open courseware, but this is just sort of the pattern that I've seen. So um, I just offer that as sort of the typical OCW workflow, a very high level, not you know, not a lot of detail. Um, and the the open course library work workflow. The, the reason it's, um, I've got it in a straight line is faculty, the faculty who teach the course, um, they also are the, so we went through a competitive bid process and selected um, uh, the best, or among the best faculty to, to be part of the open course library. So they built materials, they used OER, existing OER materials, and then sort of filled in the gaps with their own materials. And they created this open course, and then they proceeded to teach from that open course. So, um, so it's more of a straight line workflow, if you will. And um, and the reason this is important to our system is we don't have um, funding for you know to keep an open courseware site alive. Um, we 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 depend on you know what we're trying to do is actually affect a, a cultural shift in in, in the in the way we build courses, and and um, and so we're jump starting with this with this open course library. We're sort of jump starting that process. In other words, um, really building the open course as part of the process of getting to that that course that you're going to teach at the end. And um, so you have basically a single workflow. And it really, um, in, in our case, in, in the first phase, in these first 42 courses that we did, it really um, uh, sort of leverages the existing technologies. So we didn't run out and buy something new, um, mainly because we couldn't afford to, but, um, but also just because, again, it's the learning management system that a lot of the faculty were using um, was something that we could leverage. We, we had them create that course within it, and then um, we did course we did exports from that course and and so at the end of the day we, we will have guest accounts that faculty can come into or that anyone can come into uh, so to view the course materials and then also we'll have course export files available on connections and so you can pull down a copy of that course and then start modifying it in, in your own um, institution so so that's um, 
and we're, we're trying to so we're trying to leverage what we have, work with what we have, um, to, to create a workflow that works in our system. What we're headed for, and what I, you know, I think, I think this is, for us, the ultimate um, model, and what we're looking for is that the faculty, the faculty member, the faculty designer, um, and ultimately, I guess, I, I think every faculty is in charge of their own course materials. Every faculty is their own course builder for their sections. So um, they make choices about what works for them. So every faculty member will, um, will put together a course, but, but in a system where, where with the push of a button, the same course is, is available both on the open web, you know, with all the student data removed, of course, and, um, and also as you know, in, in, a, in some kind of a learning management system that, that the faculty can use. So that's, that's my hope, and so that's why I've kind of put the two circles together. Again, it's just this idea that if we're really going to mainstream the, you know, open education, at least in our system, we really need to find uh, ways that, um, that don't introduce additional complexity or technology, but rather just allow faculty to have openness the, the potential to openly publish within the same pathway as, as what, they, um, what they're already doing. And I realize that right now alarm bells are probably going off in many of your heads thinking about copyright and things like that, but clearly there's an education component to understanding um, you know, what, what elements of a course you would need to flag to, to not expose. And, uh, and so the feature, you know, this open publishing feature that we're looking for in our um, in our next learning management system, because we're in the process of a search for our, our next learning management system, and one of the requirements is that we need an open publishing feature. And that, that requirement ideally would have a way to differentiate between pieces of a course, where you say, well, yeah, this is under fair use, you know, I've made some, some copies here that I'm not going to put on the open web, obviously, of perhaps um, some articles or something that I don't have permission to to put out there, so I'll flag those this way, and those won't get pushed through to the open course. So you sort of have that that same idea of um, uh, differentiating between what you're allowed to, to put out there and what you're not. Um, so that's that's the um, you know that that's the end goal, and and uh, I think that more and more learning management systems are supporting. Creative Commons are supporting open publishing, and um, and I, so I think that there are features that we can, you know, and, and we're also I think by by the fact that we're demanding this in our request for proposals, it also drives the drives the market somewhat um, because it's a you know it's a fairly big um, RFP system wide 34 colleges it's it's a big deal. So yeah, I may have missed this. Uh, I apologize if I did, but. What is the LMS you're using now? So right now we're using Angel, which you know has been bought by Blackboard, and so we're we're in that downward spiral, and, um, and, and so we know that we, we eventually have to go to something else. Right? Tell us uh, what you really think. <laughs> well, it's you know even if we go with Blackboard, we have to go to something else, right? Because we've been we've been assimilated, so we, we you know we, we have to. We have to make a decision here. So, so we're, we're sort of using that as, as a good opportunity to, um, to really put in some other, you know, some, some other asks of really what we want out of the LMS. And, and you know, as I think you're, you're seeing, open education is, is a, a big component of, of what we do. And, uh, and so it's, it's something that we're, that we're pushing for. Um, so th this is a little bit more about the open course library. Really, a um, little bit of an overview that, and I've, and I've already touched on some of these. But um, designing these 81 courses, and um, one of the goals here, and I think there was a session just just before us uh, where Eric Frank talked a little bit about um, uh, how some some there's research now that's showing that, uh, or at least preliminary research showing that faculty, or excuse me. That students are are not able to purchase all of their textbooks. They're actually not buying some of their textbooks because of um, because of the high cost. And so, 
So we're positing that completion rates are being impacted because of that. And so we're, we're doing our own study to see if um, by, by introducing these open materials and, and looking at courses that pick, the, pick uh, to adopt these, these materials that are more affordable, will that have an impact um, on completion rates within our system? So it's, um, but that's, that's one of our goals. And then, um, and then the rest I think we've talked about. But, um, but really, you know, helping our, our faculty in Washington State to really to in, be able to engage with the, uh, with the open education movement is, is an important goal too. Okay, so, um, so the, the courses will be available, the first 42 courses will be available at opencourselibrary.org. Um, and that's going to be on Monday. We're, uh, we're excited and we're working hard to get that all ready. Um, and the next 39 courses will be available um, in spring of 2013. So the, and the process is, is um, just, just so you understand how, we, how we've done this, we essentially, um, we essentially with the grant funds, we, we buy out the faculty's, uh, a third of the faculty time over, the, over three quarters. The first two quarters are for design, so they're actually creating um, some materials, but, but mainly they're working, they're, uh, working to bring together and curate the high quality existing open educational resources that, that, uh, that they can find for their particular um, discipline. So um, they work every faculty, cor every course has at least one faculty member. There are a few that have teams, um, depending on how they, uh, how they applied for the, for the, the grant. And every faculty, every faculty member is, works with an instructional designer and a librarian. And they, um, so they are, they're, they're a team of at least three. And the instructional designer is uh, Quality Matters trained. And so we, uh, we use a lot of the Quality Matters um, principles to design the course. And then, um, and then the, so the first two quarters, the faculty, instructional designer, and librarian work to, to basically uh, create a course map, um, plan out course objectives, and uh, really design the course and then bring in the content, the open content to go with it. Um, third quarter is, uh, is a pilot quarter, so every course that we're releasing has been pilot taught at least once, um, but usually multiple times uh, because they continue to teach with that, with that uh, course. And one thing I should point out is that um, we eat our own dog food. So every faculty member actually pr produces a course and then agrees to adopt it. So we, we're not creating materials and then, and then sort of leaving them there and, and going and doing something else. What we create, we use. So every faculty member that has been part of the Open Course Library is using the, the materials themselves. Um, and so then in the fourth quarter, uh, the third quarter is, is not a paid quarter. It's faculty would have been teaching anyway. So, so in terms of the, the design, these, the first two quarters, our um, faculty time is bought out by the grant. And then the fourth quarter is a revision quarter to um, polish up and prepare the, the final course. So, so over the over a year, we we create, um, we design the, the open courses, and um, let's see. Okay, and so this talks a little bit of, about the how we how we start with learning objectives. We go to um, go to the OER first. We look for the resources that are available, and then fill in the gaps with, with our own content. So it's um, the idea is we're not we're not out to reinvent the wheel. We're not asking faculty to go build a textbook. Um, we're asking them to curate and bring together the best materials in their in their course, and um, and then and of course that varies because some courses have more OER than others. But but that's the goal. Um, so the idea that we can have more, better, faster, um, basically uh, the Open Course Library courses are digital, so they're easily shareable on, 
on the greatest distribution network known to man, called the internet. Um, they're non-rivalrous, they're scalable, um, they're searchable, and, and one of the benefits that they have is that uh, these courses, because they're out in the open, really allow students to make better decisions about what courses they're taking. So if I could, if I could have previewed uh, my courses before enrolling as a student, um, I made a, might have made some different choices, or, um, or maybe not, but at least I would have known what I was signing up for. So the idea that you can preview courses before, at, from a student's perspective, I think, adds value. Also, looking back as an alumni, um, being able to review your courses, whether you're completely done with school or you're just going into the next course that depends on the, the last course that has some kind of a prereq, I know that faculty um, sort of don't trust the prerequisites in a lot of, in a lot of areas and end up reteaching most of that content anyway because they have no idea if anyone, if, if everyone was really exposed to it. Well, in this, in this situation, the faculty could point back to the open course and say, well, if you need to brush up on you know, this material, then here's the link and go do that. Um, so, so, and I, I think generally it just paves the way for lifelong learning. If you can always go back to the courses, I, I think it's a tragedy that, uh, you know, the way that, the way that learning management systems have worked in the past, at least, is everything's measured and, and billed by the megabyte. That's just a tragedy, because what does that do? That encourages the deletion of great courses uh, constantly. And uh, so I hope we get away from that. Um, and then finally, open courses can be customized. They can be translated. I mean, it seems seems like you ought to be able to, to, to translate or caption something, um, but actually you can't if it's, if it's copyrighted and, uh, and all rights reserved. You can't until you have permission from the, from the, uh, the, the owner. So, um, so those are some other advantages. One, a, a neat highlight for the open course library is that even before it's released, um, we heard that the, uh, the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil, was uh, had, had committed to translate all of the Open Course Library courses into Portuguese. So um, clearly, other places in the world uh, are understanding the value of, of collaborative, shared uh, educational content. And, and I think that um, so we want to get in that game in a, in a big way. So my time is almost up, and I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. But let me just sort of um, show you a little bit of what that means um, you know, in terms of um, in terms of enrollments for our 81 courses in Washington State's two-year public two-year colleges, that represents uh, 411,133 enrollments every year. Um, and of course, some of these are students enrolling in more than one course that's now been developed as an open course library course. But it's just a lot of enrollments, and um, and so we've you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of potential textbook savings to students here. It's like like we talked, like we heard in the keynote this morning. Though it's not just about savings. I think it's also about um, the opportunity for improving quality. And because you can modify, because you can adapt, you can you can custom tailor uh, a resource to your needs. And in that sense, it's higher quality to you. Um, so, question is, how much could your students be saving? Um, and then just the argument about the completion rates. Um, student Perg's report that I think was mentioned in, in Eric's um, presentation was just that if students can't afford the textbooks and are not buying them, then it stands to reason that we're, you know, completion rates are being impacted in those courses. So by making them more affordable, we expect and we hope that the course materials will be, um, that the, the completion rates rather will be Will, will increase. And, um, and finally, just some, some things that we're doing different in, in the second phase of the Open Course Library. Um, with the first phase, we, we found, we learned something about using a learning management system to create content, uh, to create open content. And that is that um, it's, it's difficult to, once you've gotten it to that point, it's, it's difficult um, to back it out, unless so unless you're in that particular learning management system, you um, 
you've got to be, you've got to have the kind of technology support to be able to take um, the exported file and re-import it into your learning management system. There are um, interoperable files that allow that. Common Cartridge is what we use. Um, so it's not a question of interoperability. It's just a simple question of will faculty um, will faculty adopt more if if uh, if they can jump right in and, and get right into the content themselves. And I think the I think the answer is yes. I think the the, the likelihood that they would reuse courses goes way up if it's in a format that they can just grab, download as a PDF, a Word document, whatever file format they want, and, um, and, and then start customizing it for their needs. So in phase two, we're going to be developing everything in Google Docs. We'll be using a Google site to keep all of the courses organized. And it's um, just a system that is uh, a little more simple for faculty who are not um, accustomed to working in a learning management system. It's just something that, that, you know, a big part of all of the, the open course library is just trying new things, uh, learning how to come at the problem of, of you know, broad adoption um, at, on the faculty level, trying to make that happen more and, and happen faster. So we're going we're gonna to push ahead with Google Docs in phase two, and we're excited to see how that works out, and we'll share that when we're done. So. Um, all of the and all of the project information, everything is all on that same site. So it's uh, um, opencourselibrary.org. And just a few, you know, we had some pros and cons with switching to Google Docs, but I think generally speaking, we're very happy with the choice. And uh, we asked the Phase One faculty about it, and they were just, you know, like we we wish we could have done it that way. <laughs> so um, so this is, I think, really t we learned something here, and that's part of what this project was about. Was uh, finding the right path, or finding the best path possible for our system to, to be able to, to do OER uh, on the faculty level. So, um, with that, slides just keep coming, make them stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's see, oh yeah, and then this is just talking about our adoption plan. We're going we're gonna to get out, so just quickly, we're going to have adoption efforts that follow up on the first phase, including all new when we have new faculty trainings, they'll be we'll be sharing the open course library. It's all voluntary; we don't force it on anyone. But we expose everyone, so that's the plan. And that's it. Thank you.